Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If this is your first time here, or you've been here for a while and haven't done so just yet, please make sure to show that subscribe button some love and setting your notifications to all that way you know every time I upload a video. A quick reminder to anyone who is new or has been here or just sitting in the back row. I always place an ad right after the intro, and then I do another ad after the first story. The first story is always short for a reason. That's just so all the ads can get out of the way, and you can enjoy the entirety of the video without being disturbed by those pesky ads. Now, with all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Let's Not Meet Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. So, this happened when I was nine years old and in elementary school. There was a dance coming up and me and my older sister, who was 10 at the time, and like three friends, all girls, decided we would make some money for it. We choose to go around the neighborhood in our bathing suits trying to wash cars for reasons my parents weren't the most responsible, so they said we could. I couldn't tell you how many other people we talked to before we got to his house, but I remember the bright blue truck like it was yesterday. He lived down the street from us, and so we went up to his front door that was kind of hidden by a huge deck. We knocked on the door, and this old man, who was rather big, opened the door. We asked if we could wash his truck for like five dollars. He said yes even let us use his water hose. We get started, but for some reason, he was watching us. Unlike everyone else who let us wash their car. That made me uneasy, but I shook it off. But then, he pulled out a small camera and started taking pictures. So, I started to hurry, and so did my friends and sister. When we figured we were done, we asked for the money. He said he had to go get it from his house. We followed him to his front door. He came out with a whole $20, but by then I was so uneasy and nervous, my sister took notice. He then said he had candy inside if we wanted some. We quickly said no thanks and ran off. Whenever we would revisit that neighborhood when I was older, that same blue truck was still there. This story is bizarre as all hell. I still remember it clear as daylight. It was probably May 1st of 2005 in my hometown of Bumfuck Nowhere, Maine. I was four years old, with my father walking around the May Day Festival. It's a small festival put on every year at the local high school with a bounce house, baked goods, face painting, fire safety teachings, and one lone paramedic just in case anything were to transpire. And, of course, a couple food vendors here and there. Now, this specific year, they had a random clown doing balloon animals for all the kids. And I asked my father, Will you get me one? He looked over at the clown, smiling, then down at me. Why don't you wait here for a moment? Let me grab some water and we can go together, he said giving me a very happy medium. I smiled up at him, but also being four and naive, I didn't listen. I marched my little legs over to the tall clown, probably 5'11", scrawny, had overalls with paint splatter all over him, a red styrofoam nose, white base, and a big red smile with blue grease paint smudged haphazardly around his eyes. 
long, scraggly hair that only came down from the side of his head, leaving a bald donut on top. I thought that's how all clowns looked. He had white gloves on, stained in brown and deep mahogany colors. I thought paint, but who fucking knows at this stage? He was making a giraffe for a little boy before me, and I was too shy to interrupt, just kind of mesmerized at what he had done. I stepped forward, very bashful, and stuttered out a week. Excuse me, sir. His head whipped over at me, and his eyes stared almost through my soul. I could not see irises, just black pupils. I was about to ask him for a sword or something when he reached down so quick, he grabbed my left wrist, yanked it up, and sank his teeth into my forearm. I was shrieking within a millisecond. The guy let go of me and darted off down the back exit of the high school. I had a giant blue mark outlining my arm. My father was by my side immediately. He looked up and saw the guy taking off down the road. He was mad, but just picked me up and ran me over to the paramedics' tent. There were cops called, people surrounding us at the tent trying to see my arm. In a small town like that, everyone has to be involved. This was a pretty high quality cell phone day, so no one was filming this or anything. But plenty of my hometown residents saw it, all horrified. Everyone who saw it had to give a statement to the cops, including me and my father. After all these years, my father told me the event coordinators came up to him after my mom picked me up and said they never hired a clown for entertainment, nor did the cops ever find the guy. They told my dad it was probably some drugged-up junkie having a bad trip and took it out on me. My hometown has one of the worst drug epidemics in the state, so it would not surprise me. The irony of this story, my mom sent me to circus school when I was in middle school, and she also started an animal-free circus made entirely of puppets. You could say I now have clown DNA. I started this back in September last year, but never got around to sharing my story with everyone. I am now due to an uncomfortable situation yet again. Please bear with me if it sounds like I'm rambling too much. I have to get some context out of the way. Let me start off by saying that I live in an apartment complex by a golf course and country club on the edge of town. Since not many people live in this area, it can get pretty quiet at night. The complex is built partially into a small hill at the end of the road, with my apartment being on the back corner of the building on the ground floor. So the bottom of the windows in the living room and both bedrooms start literally a few inches above the ground outside. There is also a trail behind my apartment building that goes through a small wooded patch. I don't have much of a view since my living room windows face a good 15-20 foot patch of grass before a tree line separating it from a few houses on the next street over. This story has been ongoing for the last couple of months. Not entirely sure if this is just paranoia or coincidental. Last summer, a family moved into a house on the next street over, a couple of houses down from my apartment. I've only seen one middle-aged man and a dog so far. I was taking my shih tzu, Harley, outside one day while he was out in the backyard, just standing with his arms crossed, swaying side to side. Like an NPC character in 2000's video games, waiting to be interacted with. The dumpster shed area is in view of his backyard. We made eye contact, so I awkwardly waved and then just looked down at my phone while Harley did her business. But I could tell from my peripheral vision that he didn't look away from us. We have the same breed of dog, so I just assumed 
he was probably thinking of letting them meet sometime, but I wondered why he didn't have his dog outside with him. I just went back inside quickly after Harley was done. My younger brother lives in the same complex as I do, but on the second floor. He told me that every now and then, he'd see that man take his dog out into his backyard, but then he'd cross the tree line into the complex's yard. He would circle the building slowly, a little too close to the building, before going back into his own home. In September last year, my boyfriend at the time and I split up. I might have told him to leave. I went to a friend's house to vent. I didn't want to leave Harley home alone too long, so after about an hour or so, I came back to my apartment. I knocked out on the couch while I had a black screen rain sound video from YouTube on. I woke up at around 2 a.m. to Harley going crazy, barking and growling. The other couch is right under the main window in my living room. Harley can climb up the couch and was barking at the window between the curtains. I get up to get her down and be quiet when my stomach dropped when I realized something. The curtains are on the thinner side and I can normally faintly see the street lights from the next street over through the curtains. I started getting a little nervous, realizing that there was a black mass blocking some of the light above where Harley was standing. I grabbed the remote to shut the TV off while I was getting closer to the window. The TV turns off in the style of retro TVs, where the picture closes in on itself. When I turned it off, the flash animation on the TV illuminated the room briefly. It was just enough that I was able to make out a form of someone dressed in black and dark clothes was crouched down looking into my window. In the flash, they probably saw me too because they ran away quickly. I picked up Harley and ran to the kitchen to grab a knife and went to my room locking the door. I texted my ex asking him if he was outside of the window just then. He replied back, no, and ask what was happening. I didn't believe him because he's never awake that late and told him I was about to call the police, so to just tell the truth. He told me that I should call them either way and sent me his live location, showing that he was at his friend's house over an hour away. I called the police and let them know I had seen someone standing outside my window. They came and looked around finding nothing, obviously. An officer told me they'd keep someone in the area and to just call back if anything else happened. Over the next couple of weeks, around the same time, 2 to 3 a.m. each night, Harley would freak out at the window. By the time I'd get to her, I couldn't see anyone outside. Fast forward now to May of 2024. This last week, I went through the storage closet and found some of my ex's things. I was out with some friends tonight when he came to pick them up. He ended up texting me to come home so we could talk about something extremely important. I get home and I notice that he has a puzzled look on his face. I ask what couldn't have been just a text message. And he told me that while he was loading his stuff into his truck, he took Harley out quick. He was approached by an older lady that lives on the second floor. The dumpster is at the end of the parking lot, and if you turn right, you'll face the side of the building in the general area outside my living room window. There's a few big trees keeping the area back there pretty dark, even during the summertime. It's deeply shaded. She said that she was taking her trash out. She heard a twig snap and looked over in the direction that it came from. She said she saw a man outside my window, not just walking around. He was up close, peering into my living room, one hand up on the window trying to block the light so he could see, and his phone in the other hand, pointing inside my apartment. She yelled out, asking him what the fuck he was doing, but he just acted like he didn't hear her and walked away slowly in the opposite direction. 
She said it would be one thing if he was just walking through the yard and glanced over at my window, but he was full on pressing his face against the glass looking in. My blood ran ice cold and I got goosebumps. I have since bought a ring camera, which is something I should have done a long time ago. I'll update if anything else happens. Stay vigilant out there, everyone. Hello, everyone. So, I just got back from a trip to New York City. I go there multiple times a year, as I have family and a handful of close friends that live there. Been meaning to post this story since it happened a couple of nights ago, but I wanted to make sure I had the time to sit down and regather all the details correctly. I'm sure we've all heard crazy subway stories at one point or another, but I never thought I would end up in one this terrifying. So, I was heading back to my hotel from a friend's house at about 3 a.m. the other night. Friend lives deep in Brooklyn. My hotel was in Manhattan, so if you know the city, you know that's about a 30 to 45 minute long train ride, give or take. My train finally arrived and I was happy to be headed home. I was exhausted and it was late. My trip had been going unexpectedly well up until this point, so I had faith I'd be able to get home with no worries, especially since the trains and streets were basically empty at this hour. The train was brand new and had just been cleaned, something I've never seen before. Hell, it even smelled like a new car and still had fresh mop water on the floor. There was only about three other people on my train, all minding their own business. So far, so good. About two stops into the train ride, a man that looked like he was in his late 20s stumbled over into the train car mid-ride through the connecting doors of the cars. He had on a Nike ski mask, a Shiesti mask, if you know you know which usually isn't a good sign on a nice 70-degree night in general context, but I'm not one to judge by appearance. Plus, I know the Shiesti mask is sort of a trend nowadays, so I didn't think too much of it at first. He sort of hobbled in, and he was clutching a stomach, almost as if he was concealing something or hiding a wound. His eyes were bloodshot red, and at first... I thought it was because he was high or something. He immediately hobbled into the nearest corner and sort of sulked into that corner, facing it, until the next stop. He then ran out of the closet door and erupted into the most painful crying I have ever heard. He was just screaming, moaning, and crying, all while stumble running alongside the stopped train on the platform still clutching his stomach, screaming things like, Why? And gasping through his tears. Keep in mind, I'm sitting in the middle of the train facing away from the side he got off, so I'm kind of breaking my neck behind me as he's running behind me to watch what's going on. He then ran back into the same car, through the door on the opposite side of the car now. He was on my right before, but now he's on my left. There is no one in between me and him now since everyone else was closer to the right side. He did the sulking while facing into the corner thing on the other side of the car now, but this time he kept screaming, crying, and yelling things like, Why? Again and again, but he was crying so hysterically that it was hard to make out a lot of what he was saying. From the certain words I gathered, though, I'm almost positive that a very close friend of his had just gotten killed or something. It's the only thing that would explain the way he was acting and the things he was saying. Plus, he was suited up like he had just come back from a street mission gone bad or something. At this point, everyone on the train was frantically flickering their eyes over to him every few seconds. 
You could tell they were panicked, but not trying to cause a scene about it or rile him up even more. I was getting a little sussed out myself, but I had seen and heard about worse on the subway, and if someone he knew had really just died, then I honestly felt horrible for the guy before anything else. But then the entire situation escalated to a point that I had only seen in movies or crime shows until now. The man stayed in his corner, crying, screaming, and muttering things to himself for another three minutes or so, all while still clutching his stomach as if he was concealing something. I definitely seen a black object in his hands by that point, but I couldn't tell if it was big enough to be a gun or not. After I saw this, I tried not to take my eyes off of him for too long at a time since I was the closest person next to him. But I also didn't want to stare. By this point, he was starting to say concerning things like, Someone's gonna pay for this. And then he would just repeat it louder and louder. And then he burst into a dialogue that made my heart fucking drop. Keep in mind, he's still facing the corner, hunched over, clutching his item. <laughs> All you motherfuckers sitting on this train right now, you're gonna fucking feel me tonight. You hear me? Y'all gonna feel me tonight. And y'all gonna fucking hate it too. Oh my god. <laughs> y'all gonna fucking hate this. Y'all are gonna hate me. He kept getting louder and louder as he was saying this to the point where he was basically screaming by the last part. I don't know what he said after that because as soon as that train stopped, next, I fucking bolted out of there. He was screaming shit at me as I got off, but I couldn't hear it, and I definitely wasn't going to turn around. I ran back to the nearest street exit, chain-smoked a couple cigarettes, and waited 20 minutes for the next train to come. I've seen worse in my life to know that this wasn't a situation I was willing to gamble with at all. I pray the last three people on that train got home safe and nothing happened. I briefly searched Twitter and the news the next day for any possible info I could find, and I didn't see anything. But, who even knows what's worth a headline to them down there anymore? So, to the man in the subway at 3 a.m., I pray you find the solace you need and heal from whatever trauma you're going through. But please, let's not ever meet again. All right, buckle up. One day I had a creepy encounter with my family doctor. I'm a 35 year old woman now, but this encounter happened when I was around 14 or 15 years old. So about 20 years ago now. But the memory is as fresh and as vivid as though it happened yesterday. I haven't even thought of this story in many years until I came across this Reddit channel and after reading some of the other stories, my own personal memory of the story came flooding back. So anyway, everyone in my family, and some still do, used to see this one family doctor for many, many years for all of our medical needs. We'll call him Dr. D. We'd been seeing this doctor for so long, he was even there at the delivery of my birth where he held me in his arms when I was just a newborn baby. From then on, I would see him for everything, every time I got sick, for all of my immunizations, etc., etc. So it was only natural that I would go see him the day I needed to get my first pap smear ever done. I had just started becoming sexually active for the first time with my very first boyfriend at this stage, and I had learned in school sex ed, as well as from 
other various sources that once a female starts becoming sexually active, they need to start getting pap smears tests done. For those who may not know what a pap smear or pap test is, it's a test or a procedure done by your doctor to check for cervical cancer in women. The test is not painful in any way, but can feel a bit strange, uncomfortable, and invasive as it requires a swab being inserted inside to collect the sample. Other than that, it is a very quick procedure that altogether takes no longer than a minute or two from start to finish. This last point is important to take note of for later in the story. So, it's important to note here that even before arriving to my appointment, I was already in a state of feeling a bit freaked out and uncomfortable with the whole situation because at 14, I was a lot like most young girls at my age, where I felt very awkward about my growing body, had poor self-image, would often wear baggy clothes to hide the signs of my womanhood from the outside world, such as the breasts that were forming. So the idea that I had to do a test that required I strip from the waist down, sitting on a bench with my legs wide open, only to have some random grown-up come right up in there and fiddle around down there. It sounded to me like the last thing in the world I wanted to do and was feeling already very embarrassed about it. And even though I was told by many different people that if I wanted, and if it made me more comfortable, I could request for a female doctor to do the test, but for some reason I had turned that option down. And yes, this is something I would regret later. I guess I just thought in my head, it's okay, I'll just see Dr. D like I always do. I mean, he is my family doctor. I've known him for years, so it's only natural I continue to see him and treat this appointment like any other appointment. And I guess I still managed to convince myself to stop being so silly. Everything is fine. And besides, he is a professional doctor who will approach this situation with professionalism and will conduct himself in a way that will not make me feel any more awkward than I already do. Oh, how wrong I was. So, Dr. D tells me to take off everything from the waist down and to lie on the bed, put the white sheet over my lap, and wait for him while he gets everything together. I do this, feeling a bit red in the face, but I do as he asks, hurriedly, as I am impatient to get this over and done with quickly. When he does come around the curtain, he sits down on the low stool right between my legs, whips off the sheet and looks up at me with a big smile on his face. He then proceeds to have a conversation with me about... Uh, you know what? I don't even remember what it was about. However, what I do remember was that it wasn't at all relevant to the situation at hand or anything to do with the test or any medical information in relation to me whatsoever. I just remembered that he had chosen that moment to talk about other trivial things like, so, how's the family going? Or, what year level are you doing at school now? And things of that nature. Honestly, I wouldn't have been listening to anything he was saying at the time, as all I would have been thinking about is me screaming at him to hurry up and to get on with it. And that I do not feel like having a chit-chat with him while my private bits are right in his face. But if I had thought for a second that this ill-timed catch-up session would be the most uncomfortable thing to happen in that moment, I would be dead wrong. As he is chit-chatting away to me, as well as going back and forth between making eye contact with me and flashing me a wide smile, to looking down at my private areas with a deep, penetrating gaze. He all of a sudden wraps his hand right around my inner thigh, closest to where my knee is. He does so just gently 
almost like he's just resting his hand there for a second. But it makes me do a little jump. He doesn't seem to notice, though, and continues talking. And as he's talking, I realize that he slowly started to circle his thumb on my inner thigh in a slow, gentle caress. Immediately, alarm bells started ringing in my head, and I'm thinking to myself, what in the hell is he doing? The action was almost like he was trying to soothe or relax me in some way. Sort of how like a mother might use her hand to do small circular motions on her crying baby's back in an attempt to soothe. But why? Was I maybe being outwardly obvious about how uncomfortable I was with this situation, despite the best efforts to not let it show? And even if it was obvious to Dr. D, is it normal for a doctor to do this soothing action on a patient? And on top of this, how much longer is this whole damn thing going to take anyway? I thought this was meant to be a real quick procedure. That's when, deep down, I started to realize that something was very wrong with this situation, or that I started to sense his intentions weren't good or appropriate whatsoever, because he started to move his hand slowly up my inner thigh towards my private area, still caressing me with his thumb and still gazing directly at me as he went. It's when his hand reached its destination, and not because he was about to do the swab at that stage, but to continue just to caress me, that my legs started to shake uncontrollably, not for any other reason than the fact that I was scared, and I just couldn't stop myself from shaking in fear. The two seconds later, the tears started to slowly form and roll down my face, as I let out a little whimpered sound. Of course, Dr. D immediately noticed this, but doesn't at all stop or spring back like he would hope he would do in that situation, as though he might be realizing what he's doing is wrong and decides to stop what he's doing. Does he? No. He just continues to do it more intensely and says to me, Ugh, honey, you're shaking. What's wrong? Why are you feeling so nervous? Don't be nervous, honey. Just try and relax. Everything's fine. And he continues to just caress me. It's almost like he believes his words and actions are actually helping me to relax when quite clearly it's doing the complete opposite. But for some reason, I don't say a word. I don't tell him to stop or back off. I don't move a muscle other than the uncontrollable shaking that I can't help. What's even more baffling about my behavior and reaction at this point is I even quickly try to wipe away and hide my tears from him so he doesn't see it. Because for some reason in that moment, I felt bad for him because I'm worried my tears and distress might be making his job harder in some way by me being a challenging and uncooperative patient. I can't explain why I thought or reacted this way other than the fact that I was just a 14-year-old girl who was freaking out and just didn't know what to do in an unsettling situation, and especially because it was happening with someone I knew my entire life and had looked up to and trusted for a very long time. Anyway, it relieves me to say that he eventually did perform the test and that his story doesn't end with a further graphic details of some sort of sexual assault or anything of that nature. He did, however, act completely oblivious to my distress throughout the entire thing, acted the whole way through like he wasn't doing anything wrong and that everything was just normal. Oh, and remember how earlier I mentioned this test should take maybe one to two minutes at most to complete? I was on that table for 15 minutes with him, which might not be a long amount of time, but to me, it felt like years at that moment. 
Do you know what the worst part is? The moment I got home to my parents, I burst into tears, flung myself into their arms, and proceeded to tell them the entire story. As freaked out as I was, within seconds I started to feel better. Just knowing that I was back within the safety net of their presence, but also knowing that once I finished telling them what happened, that my parents would know what to do to fix the situation, as well as offer me some much-needed comfort. But you know what? That's not what I got. What I got was being immediately thrusted out of their embrace and then straight got the biggest telling off session of my life. They didn't believe a word I had said. In fact, they got angry at me for being a troublemaker and making up stories about their trusted family doctor who they have known for years and knew for a fact wouldn't ever do anything of what I was accusing him of. Then they told me to stop crying and immediately grounded me. I was in complete and utter shock. And to this day, I'm still not sure which one is worse. My doctor doing what he did or my own family's reaction to the situation. Both experiences ended up hurting me deeply. So, nothing ever came of the situation. I had to just bottle it up inside and bury it all away, and he got away with it. The only thing I had in my power to do was make the decision to never see him again, which I haven't to this day. There have been plenty of times where I had thought about reporting him to police, especially fearing for the well-being of any other women out there in his care. But after how my parents reacted, I convinced myself that the police probably wouldn't have believed me either. If it came to me against him, I believe I would lose, so I stayed silent. I just truly hope that nothing awful has ever happened at his own hands to anybody else after my experience. So to the trusting family doctor I once looked up to, I hope I never meet you again after what you have put me through. Years ago, around 2016 or earlier, I would gotten into a relationship with a guy that I met through an online app. We had been LDR for quite some time, and although we did meet up in our one-and-a-half-year relationship, it was rare and with friends or family accommodating us. Since we weren't able to celebrate our one-year anniversary, we decided to postpone it and ended up meeting a couple months after it had passed. My boyfriend had invited me to go on a road trip with him, as he wanted us to spend time together with just the both of us there. My boyfriend had been incredibly kind and love-bombing me for the past year, and I hadn't seen any red flags yet for me to question his request. He even went so far as to personally ask permission from my parents and providing them with the complete details of the trip and offering that his cousins would travel with us if they were not comfortable with the idea of just the two of us traveling together. Needless to say, he was able to receive my parents' consent. On the day of our trip, he picked me up at home, and all is well for the early portions of our trip until we had stopped at a gas station. I thought he had just needed gas, but instead of heading towards the fuel machines, he parked on the far end of the gas station and asked me to turn off my phone and that he would be turning his off as well. I was so puzzled because he knew how important it was for me to keep in contact with my parents as they had specifically asked me to update them. He gently declined his request, but I could see that he wouldn't take no for an answer. He was trying to convince me through affection at first to comply with his request, and when it didn't work, he started becoming more aggressive. He grabbed my phone from my hands, turned it off, and put it in his pocket, along with his cell phone. 
I began to feel a surge of panic, but didn't want to alarm him, so I asked if I could quickly use the restroom. Before I could open the door, I heard the doors click. I joked with him to open the door and told him that I really needed to use the bathroom. Instead, he gave me the cold shoulder and restarted the engine. As we drove, I could feel the surge of anxiety in me. He had never behaved this way throughout the duration of our relationship. As we approached a stoplight, he grabbed something from the back of my seat, and although I couldn't clearly see what it was that he was holding, I was afraid it was a weapon. He then asked me if I loved him, and if I did, why was I constantly cheating on him? I was so confused. I asked him how I had been cheating, and with who? To my surprise, he brought up the names of my close guy friends that he had been hanging out with in the past year that we were together. He further questioned me about my night out with my friends, stating that I was probably sleeping around or getting drunk and lying to him about my whereabouts. I didn't know what to say and was at a loss for words due to the shock of what I was hearing and his behavior that has never shown itself until now. It made me question our entire relationship and if I actually knew who my boyfriend really was. It scared the shit out of me how manipulative and convincing he was not only to me but to my friends and family. It was getting dark by that time. We arrived at what looked like a cheap Airbnb. As we got out of the car and walked to the lobby, he didn't say a word. He stated his name and room number that he had reserved for us, and the receptionist smiled and greeted me as I locked eyes with her. Hoping to alert her, I stared intently at her and tried to mouth out that I needed help, but... She didn't seem to understand what I was saying and made the painful mistake of asking my boyfriend who hurriedly walked us out to the lobby, then into our room. That night was the most horrific night of my life, which left me traumatized and angry. He had stripped me down to my underwear. He reiterated the same questions he asked in the car on the trip here. And every time he felt I gave the wrong answer, I was flogged with the belt he had worn with his pants that day. I vividly remember crying the entire night, and every hit that came across my body, it felt like it wouldn't end, and his anger only grew when I made the grave mistake of accepting his accusations in the hopes that he would finally stop. Instead... I was dragged into the bathroom, waterboarded, and repeatedly assaulted that night. I think I tried to block parts of it out of my mind because I couldn't remember the whole thing. Every attempt I had tried to get away only fueled him more and his cold, blank stare at me. All I could think about was if he was going to kill me that night, as I remembered that he had grabbed something out of the back of the seat before we left the car. I finally got the answer to that when I saw him grab what looked like a wrench. He held it up, looking at me as if warning me not to move from the floor where I had sat down, curled up into a ball. I endured the ordeal till the early mornings and waited for him to fall asleep. When he finally did, at around 2 a.m., I grabbed my phone and t-shirt and managed to quietly leave the room and use the back exit of the Airbnb to leave. I didn't care that I wasn't fully clothed and didn't have on any shoes. I ran out to the road in hopes of finding anybody to help me or at that very least get a ride out. As I was getting close to the middle of the road, I felt something grab the back of my shirt. It was my boyfriend. He was obviously pissed off and began dragging me. 
I tried to get away despite feeling my feet and legs were being dragged across concrete. Luckily enough, there was a coast guard who spotted us. We had stayed near a water area, and I made it incredibly clear to the coast guard that I wanted to get away from my boyfriend who tried to act like everything was okay. This good-hearted soul alerted the police and kept my boyfriend a short distance from me until they arrived. I saw the expression on the Coast Guard's face turn from angry to horrified as he spoke to the police. Despite being incredibly embarrassed and knowing I would get an earful for my parents, I contacted them and they picked me up at the police station horrified at my state. I later learned that he was an ex-convict who had been released two years ago and had been charged with assault and battery by several women in his province before he moved to the city. He went by a different name then and had chosen online dating and had been privately messaging various women apart from me, and I was the unfortunate victim who fell for his charades. I couldn't imagine what else would have happened to me if the Coast Guard hadn't spotted us and helped me. To this day, I still vividly remember this encounter and haven't completely recovered. I didn't hear from my boyfriend again and cut off ties with him that day. I can only hope he was either arrested or has not found another victim. So this was about five years ago, and it still creeps me out. I was 18 at the time. I'm now 23. I was walking home from work at the local pizzeria joint and took my usual route home. It was about 9.45 to 10.15 p.m., and it was super dark outside. As I'm getting about 100 yards away from the street I live on, a white van turns onto that street. Nothing suspicious, but something didn't sit right with me. So I yanked out my earbuds and paused my music. I then turned down my street, and as I'm getting closer to my house... I started getting a weird gut feeling. I look up from my phone as I was about to text my roommate, who was out of town at the time, that I was almost home, about 15 yards or so. And as I look up, I notice the white van sitting in front of my house, and the man inside is just staring at me, the yellow car light shining on his face. He had brown hair, glasses and facial hair his van lights were off but his car was running i stopped and put my back to a tree in my neighbor's yard and just stood there maintaining eye contact with this man after about what seemed like eternity which was probably like five minutes he starts driving towards the stop sign at the end of the road i didn't put my back to him I kept my back to the tree and maintained visual on the van the entire time until it stopped at the stop sign. He just sat there for probably two to three minutes, all while I'm not looking away and my back still on the tree. Finally, he turned right, the direction in which I had come from, and after about 20 seconds of making sure he or anybody else wasn't coming, I bolt to my house. I quickly get inside and lock the door. I go to the window and very quietly look through the blinds. I didn't turn on any light because I'm not stupid. After a few seconds of looking, he drove back up and down the street and left again. Afterwards, I texted my roommate what happened and then went to each and every one of the windows in my house to make sure that they were locked, along with the back door and garage door. I made sure to keep all lights off for the remainder of the night. 
I didn't sleep a lick that night. I was too paranoid at every sound or movement. Let's just say I never walked home after that. To the man in the van, let's not meet again. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true Let's Not Meet stories. Before I go on any further, I would like to acknowledge and thank the elite members of Back to Ashes. Colt Stonewolf, Nat Davies, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Interscare, Christy Elias, Sugared Spite, Tina Mee, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Eda Smith, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty Sneeze, Denise S., Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for your continued support. If it weren't for you, there would not be a me, and there would not be a Back to Ashes channel. Thank you sincerely. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. Be safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourselves a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.